welcome everybody. Uh, it's eight o'clock in the morning, so I'm gonna give you some homework immediately. <laughs> uh, we did want to make sure that we address some of the things that keep you up at night. So you have a pen and paper ahead in front of you. If you could write down some of the things that really keep you up at night, we have a wealth of knowledge up here. We're gonna get through a few questions of our own and then we'll start addressing some of the things that, that you guys are thinking about. I have a whole team from Facilitron in the back corner there and they'll walk around. When you have something ready, you can just raise your hand and they'll come by and get it. But without further ado, I wanna get started. Um, initially, I want, we wanna talk about the pandemic. That's something that we've all been through. Um, Facilitron is in uh, districts all across the country and what we found when the pandemic happened is initially everybody did a shutdown and it was right around spring break, so it, it worked. Uh, then we had districts that literally stayed shut down for two years. They only let people on campus if they were picking up meals, if they were picking up Chromebooks. They didn't let the community do rentals. They didn't have staff and students on campus, two solid years. We also saw districts that did kind of a rolling, they'd open, there'd be something would happen, they'd close. They'd open again, they'd close again. And then we had a few districts, very few, that opened after the summer and kind of stayed open. But what we found is uh, they had different needs during this period. Facilitron had to change and we had to come up with attendee management so that people would know who was on campus when they were on campus, who could have come in contact with each other, that kind of thing. We also had to suspend a lot of reservations, cancel a lot of reservations on behalf of our districts, refund money, repurpose things. You know, it was all very confusing for, for everybody. Now that people are really back in school, it seems to be an indication to the world that things are back to normal. But what we're finding with our district partners is, although the world may see being back in school as being back to normal, it's not the same as it was before the pandemic. So with our panel here, I wanna ask all of you, what are the new strains being put on the facilities based on what students and staff have been through? They're dealing with mental health issues, they're dealing with having um, been out of education for a long time and maybe they're not where they should be educationally. So what are some of the strains that you guys are going through with your facilities based on this? We'll go ahead and start with Joe. Well, good morning everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, honored to be with this distinguished uh, panelist. Um, a lot of things that, are, that you mentioned obviously are, are big issues for us is the mental health part of it. And um, we're finding that uh, students are coming back into the environment um, not prepared for the social interac interactions that they're now engaging in. And then there's a lot of stress going on with our students. And um, one of the things in, in Florida, a recent law that's been passed, is that now 80% of the district employees have to go through this youth mental health training. Um, so we can, not that, not that we could be professionals at, at mental health, but we can at least recognize the signs that are, that are occurring in students. And that's uh, a big issue for us. And I just went through the, the training myself. It's a day-long training, and it's, it's great so we can help um, these students who are suffering um, with all kinds of issues. Um, but as, as that pertains to our facilities, it's a lot of um, what we're going to talk about a little bit later on is about how that affects safety and security and, and um, the need to make sure that um, everybody is, is safe on our campuses and recognizing signs of, of individuals. And this, it's, it's not just... It's not the individuals who are suffering the mental health issues themselves. They're always the ones who are the, the aggressives, but also they're being bullied or things are being happen, mm -hmm. happening to them. And there's a lot of conversations now going around um, about facilities in terms of you know um, male and female restrooms and uh, gender neutral restrooms and locker rooms and those kind of things. And how do we keep our, our students safe in those kinds of environments and how can we can at the same time, affirm all of our students to make sure that they that we're seeing them, that we're seeing them, and that we're recognizing that they're going through some different things in their lives, and that we're providing an environment in which they can feel safe in. So that's that's the big issue for us is really to make sure that our our students are safe and that they feel safe in, our, in their environment, and um, and that we can recognize when things are are not so good for for individual students. Mm -hmm. So, Roy, from the parent perspective, what are, you, what are you being asked to do? Are they worried about air quality? Are they worried about, uh, you know, what's your policy for if, somebody, if there is a pet, an outbreak again? What, 
What are the parents demanding of you? All of the above. All of the above. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Um, just like Joseph, the mental health has been the big, big issue for us. And one of the things we did this past year in our new budget is we added up uh, some behavioral interventionists uh, and let our campuses add those staff members at each of their campuses so we can try to address the mental health and catch it before it becomes an incident. Uh, but we are getting a lot of pressure from our parents in terms of our facilities. They really want us to look at building prisons now. Uh, we've got some, mm -hmm. and and we all know that the research clearly shows that you know you want daylighting in your facilities and and open these things up for collaboration. And so we're trying to find that right balance as to you know to try to resolve the parents' concerns, but also make sure we have a safe and secure environment, but also make it a, a good learning environment that's inducive for them to be successful in their uh, educational career while they're in our school district. Mm -hmm. So when the pandemic happens, we see all these votes and everything about getting funding for schools, funding for schools. And so we hear about the ESSER funds. And so Wanda, maybe you can talk to how big is that pot? Does it actually show up? Are you able to do what you need to do with that kind of funding? I, I think it's an <clears throat> excellent opportunity to leverage so many different things, whether it's HVAC, whether it is uh, social emotional assistance to kids, counselors. I mean, my goal as a COO, I'm gonna spend every dime of it. Uh, and uh, I think that should be all of our goals, uh, whether it's on the academic side or the facility side. Our concern is once that money leaves, you know, what kind of position um, will we be in? Mm -hmm. Right now, um, it is so very important because not only um, students and staff and parents, but, you know, um, so many people are going through so many different things, and uh, every day it's something new. Uh, so we are doing our best to leverage it in the right places. We, we have a lot of principal input, but one thing I learned from go, going through this uh, process is we have to make sure that the money is targeted for the right things at each individual school. So this is not an um, opportunity to say one size fits all, because it really doesn't. Mm -hmm. And so our principals uh, are, are very vocal about that in terms of, you know, of course, they want to move it to other things. Uh, but you, you definitely have to have checks and balances in there to make sure the money is uh, used the right way. But it's a, it's a, it's a blessing to have that kind of money, uh, especially uh, with some of the things that um, our school districts are going through at this time. It's just mm -hmm. very difficult uh, to be in K-12 education, whether it's toxic politics or whatever, it's just a very difficult time. And the money definitely helps um, uh, all of us yep. um, to, to get a better outcome for our kids. One of the challenges I know we're gonna have in the state of Texas is that when that ESSER money runs out, we're using a lot of that to supplement some of the budgets and the overruns because we've had the cost of inflation to deal with. Mm -hmm. And now the problem is, is what are we gonna do when that USER funds run out in mm -hmm. 2023, 2024? And if the state doesn't do some changes in their funding allocation on a per student basis in the state of Texas, there's gonna be a lot of districts that are gonna have significant deficit budgets, which is then gonna result in significant budget cuts. And guess where they go to first? Uh, on the operation side of things. We have yeah. to start cutting operate, uh, operational staff, uh, maintenance folks, bus drivers, you name it. And it changes the way uh, we have to operate big time. Another part of that, Roy, is enrollment. So in, in the urban areas, uh, we have decreasing decline in enrollment, and it is very significant. And so you have this convergence of all the bad things happening around the same time. Mm -hmm. And so... Uh, our goal in Houston ISD is basically we have to transform our district. We have to reduce our footprint. I ask my team often, um, you know, what, what are we doing differently as a result of all these challenges? And uh, that's what I uh, task my team to figure out a way to do it better, more efficient, and more effective. Mm -hmm. And when you have such a bureaucratic system that a lot of school districts have, it's very difficult to change, mm -hmm. you know? But I think with the convergence of all these different factors, we have to change. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
just wanted to add, because you asked specifically about some facility issues. One thing that I think a lot of our school districts did as a result of the pandemic is we went into um, kind of a triage mode with trying to provide better air, indoor air quality for our schools. Mm -hmm. okay? So we, we have all these, um, we have these portable units now in our classrooms now that they have the HEPA filters and we, we change all of our, our filters to, to MERV 13 filters in our air ventilation systems. And now we've got to look at what is the, the long-term permanent solutions because now we have, here in Hobby County, we have a, almost 30, 000, 30 million square feet of facilities and we have one of these, um, these air purifiers in every single classroom and it cost us, this summer, it cost us close to $2 million to replace all those filters, right? That's not a sustainable solution for us, right? So we got to figure out long-term what mm -hmm. we're going to do to provide this the kind of better indoor air quality that parents are, are now expecting, teachers are now expecting in our classrooms without having to spend that kind of money every couple of years. It's just that it's, that's not sustainable for us. So I'm looking at, at this conference to get some ideas from what other people are doing. To mm -hmm. make what's, that. what's really interesting about that, Joe, is that when the pandemic hit, we weren't sure what kind of technology was out there. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So number one, we're isolated. Many of us were working from home. Right, mm -hmm. and then number two, we had to make these big audacious decisions at uh, uh, at the uh, you know with a sense of urgency. Mm -hmm. And so, one of the things that I truly valued was our superintendent at the time, Donald Fanoy the second, because he let us make those decisions. Yeah. You know, and for me and for my team in Palm Beach at the time. That was the most productive period of time we've ever had <laughs> because we were able to put cameras on buses at the drop of a dime. Mm -hmm. We were able to mm -hmm. get a bazillion uh, air purifiers, and you can say thank you later, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> say the bill. <laughs> and so, <laughs> no, but uh, yeah, so for us, you know, because we were in this vacuum, we were able to accelerate construction and those kind of things. Mm -hmm. So even though we were going through a bad situation, we were able to uh, leverage that time to be extremely productive. I think this is a good time to segue into what you're hearing is outside influences, right? We're all in the business of education. That's why we're there. We are trying to educate our students. But then you have the pandemic, and then there are all these other things that come into play. Um, so I used to work for Gilroy Unified School District, and I was not the Emergency Operations Center <laughs> Director for the state. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you for the raise, though. <laughs> <laughs> I was actually just for the district and then in, in the city of Gilroy as well. And for years, I had done safety and security. I had done uh, facility rentals and energy conservation. We did run high defend training five years with all of our students, never believed anything would happen in the little town of Gilroy. And uh, the Gilroy Garlic Festival, for those of you who don't know, we were in our 42nd year, 100,000 people in town, which is double our population. And we had a kid cut the fence and active shooter at the uh, Garlic Festival. What that did to the town, uh, they're still reeling. We haven't had a Garlic Festival since. Most of our high school students were at the festival working the festival, and then we had families with their kids you know, attending the festival. I can't tell you the number of emails and thank yous I got from parents who said, we had no idea what to do, but our students, our kids knew what to do. They knew to run, they knew where to go, um, and they felt that their lives were saved because of that. But three people did die, children. Uh, it's, a, it's a horrible thing to go through. My district was using Facilitron at the time. I made one phone call to them. I said, you need to cancel everything. Um, we need to open our gyms for, we had Red Cross shelters. All these people were from out of state. When they run, you just leave everything behind. It took weeks for people to get their things back. The FBI came out. We had to set up a family assistance center. It took over an entire elementary school. We tracked everything in Facilitron so that we could get reimbursed for things. Um, and, you know, I really leaned on them to help us through that. Two weeks later, we had to start school again. And the level of fear of parents not wanting to leave their kids in the schools, even though it didn't happen at the schools, a helicopter would fly overhead and you'd have elementary school kids in tears because helicopters were a trigger for them. And so when the shooting is over, 
and the media does their thing, you know, for 10 hours or 20 hours till they have their next thing, people forget about it and they move on. But you, you don't, I mean, you can hear my voice. It still affects me today. And honestly, I resigned shortly after that, sold everything, moved to Southern California so I could be close to my kids in the beach because when you go through something like that, what really matters in your life changes. Um, so I talk about that. Checking the news right before I came down here, there was another shooting last night at 10.30 at night at the University of Virginia. Three people killed, two injured. They're still looking for the uh, suspect, who is a student from the, from the school. Um, you know, we have two people from Texas up here, and we all know what happened in Uvalde. We have more children that didn't get to go home that day, more teachers that didn't get to go home that day. So this is something that is top of mind for everybody and has an immediate effect on what you guys have to do. So I want to go to our Texas panelists first. Uh, Roy, Uvalde isn't anywhere near Cypress Fairbanks, but I know even in my little town there were suddenly this whole list of things that we had to do. We were dealing with mental health from this, we were dealing with out-of-state guests, we were dealing with Red Cross and FBI and all this stuff, but suddenly we had to have no better locks, we had to have more fences, we had to have you know all of these things, and these mandates came down, sometimes money, sometimes not money, and then all the pressure from the uh, people who lived there as well. So based on what happened in Uvalde and the school year starting again, what kinds of changes did you have to make? What's required at the state level? And then also, is there funding to help you with these things? What are you having to deal with? Well, fortunately, uh, years ago, back in our 2007 bond program, when our superintendent came on board back then, he was using building card reader access at his other district. So even though we didn't have it budgeted in that bond program, as we renovated schools, we started putting building card readers in. Then in our 2014 bond program, we included about $55 million of money to come in and add additional cameras, complete security vestibules, uh, and, and do various other things uh, as part of our security enhancements. Then in our 2019 bond program, we added another $207 million to come in and upgrade some of the vestibules from the lessons we learned from the previous installations. Uh, we've come in and put bullet-resistant glazing in, in various locations. Uh, we've updated the actual receptionist area because we did a design on the security vestibule coming in, but once they got in the reception area, they could go anywhere in the building. Mm -hmm. And so we realized, we okay, we need to take it another step further. Uh, but we had to use local taxpayer dollars to do that. We didn't get any funding from the state of Texas. Um, now with the Uvalde shooting, uh, there were some more mandates that were asked of us in school districts in, in the state of Texas. We had to go and inspect every single exterior door and we had to certify that we had locks and all the doors were operational. You know, we had other things we know we needed to do. Certainly that was very important to do that, but we had to take manpower from different places to go ahead and do that and not do our normal uh, routine maintenance that we typically do in the summertime in order to accomplish that task. Our police department was out there helping us with that, uh, for, you know, from that standpoint. I think the governor just announced, I think through TEA, if I remember right, about $400 million might be used for some safety and security protocols in the district. That's not even going to touch the surface. I mean, you know, we're not the largest district, obviously, we're third largest, but we spent $258 million so far and that's probably still not enough on the facility side for one district. We got close to 1,200 school districts in the state of Texas. $400 million is not going to go very far. Mm -hmm. Now, we're getting ready to go into a legislative session in January, so I'm anticipating we're going to get lots of mandates or unfunded mandates from the state as to what we should be doing. At least we feel we're ahead of the curve, so we're hoping that we've anticipated some of those needs from our school district, but I know there's a lot of districts out there that did not have the resources we had available and don't have those provisions in and may, may not even have security cameras. And just adding that alone in the buildings would be very expensive um, across the board if you just take that one feature. But what the approach we've taken is a later approach uh, with our police department. We want to basically stop an intruder from getting in the building or slowing them down to our, allow our police department to come in and engage and get to the uh, facility to hopefully disengage the situation before Uvalde or another uh, Santa Fe uh, that 
happened in Houston. It was in the Houston area in Santa Fe. That was close to home. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, don't want to get political here, but our governor has made this a very political issue in the state of Texas, in my opinion. Um, he wasn't present when we had the shooting in Santa Fe a few years ago, but all of a sudden he came out to the Uvalde. He spoke out there. He got some misinformation, and then now we th I think it's been a knee-jerk reaction of some of the things he's trying to put the pressure on us as school districts to uh, try to implement in a very short period of time. So I don't know if you guys were counting, but I think he mentioned three bond measures and some state some tax funding. So you're in Houston, you're right next door. We're, does your district have that kind of funding so that you can supplement these safety items, or how are you dealing with this? Well, first of all, I'm trying to figure out how can I keep my job and be completely honest with you. Um, <laughs> what happens in this room stays in, in this room. room. Yes. <laughs> I don't know, cameras. So, so, <laughs> so I have, I have uh, two different experiences. I was in Florida uh, when. Um, uh, Marjorie Stoneman Douglas happened, and you know, and it's still very um, emotional because it never somehow you always feel like you're responsible, right? Mm -hmm. And so, but there we got little guidance, and we had quite a bit of money. You know, we had a, an, a bond, we had a tax ratification election, so we were able to. Um, Es execute on fencing, so you take a district that hadn't really been fenced, you know, and so it was a real uh, significant culture change. And not everybody liked it. You know, if you have ever seen a Palm Beach school, they're, they're, they're just absolutely beautiful. Um, and so it was a culture change. But we had the money to do the things we needed to do. Single point of entry, we had a very uh, accomplished uh, police chief at the time. So we were able to implement a lot of things with little guidance in a short period of time. Uh, fast forward to Houston. And so I feel like I'm, you know, it's, it's Groundhog Day. Uh, and so after Uvalde, you know, I don't care what part of Texas or what part of uh, the country you're in, you felt it, you saw it. And what was surprisingly different from the experience in Florida was the misinformation that mm -hmm. occurred. Uh, in Uvalde. In Florida, it was kind of about politics and gun safety and all that kind of stuff. In Uvalde, it was just bad information. Um, and it was, as Roy said, a knee-jerk reaction that we have to do something. It doesn't matter if that something is the right thing to do, but we have to do something. And so for a district our size, um, we didn't have those resources. Our last bond was in 2012, and it took three years to actually start that bond. Uh, and so we're finishing the last uh, uh, element of the bond right now. So imagine a district our size going 10 years without a bond. And so there was money set aside for safety and security, but you know, it wasn't enough. You know, and so as I said before, part of our charge uh, in our uh, uh, executive cabinet is to transform the district, and that includes safety. Uh, that includes the layering approach. Uh, a wonderful uh, chief, uh, Chief Frank Kitzrow, uh used to always preach it, you know, um, prevention, intervention, and diversion. And then you have the event. Once you get to that event, then it's uh, uh, mitigation, unification, reunification, and those kind of things. But he would always say, we don't ever want to move from the left side of the X. And that has been uh, kind of my approach, my team's approach. Safety and security is the number one, you know, we have learning loss, which is, of course, we're an educational institution. Safety and security is number two mm -hmm. and one at the same time. So if kids don't feel safe uh, and we can't keep them safe, they're not going to learn anything. It's similar to when kids uh, come to school hungry. They're not going to focus if they're hungry. Well, they're not going to focus if they don't feel safe in their school. And, and another uh, aspect of it is the threat is internal in many cases. It's not strangers walking up to your campus. It's your students that you have taught uh, in your school that have emotional issues that uh, are being bullied or don't feel like they're being listened to. That is the threat. And that 
for parents, you know, I'm a parent first, uh, it's terrifying. And so the thing that I think all of us have to do is build that trust with our community so that they know when they send their kids to school that their kids are going to be safe. Our teachers are extraordinary. Our principals are extraordinary. Uh, we have these random checks that we had in uh, Palm Beach. We have them in Houston now. And our principals and teachers are just uh, shutting these folks down that come randomly on the campus. Uh, but we have to keep in mind that this is a complete culture change for many of our schools. Our schools are happy places, right? We all have our happy school to go to, the school that makes us feel real good. I, I like pre-K, you know? Uh, so uh, this is a huge challenge. Not only do we have the funding challenges and the toxic politics, whatever side you want to be on that, on that uh, political spectrum, but we have kids afraid to go to school. Mm -hmm. and that is the saddest part uh, about all of this. And I think that for the, the, the parents and community of Uvalde and the other communities, uh, God bless them because it's hard to wake up in the morning when your kid is not going to be there. I can't even imagine. Yeah. So I challenge each and every one of us, we got to do better. And whatever that means in your context, we have to fight the good fight. Uh, the job doesn't mean anything if, you know, you have things like this happen on your watch. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, just so you guys know, at 1020 today in this room, uh, Wanda's going to be part of a discussion on a holistic approach to safety and security. So I encourage everybody to come, come see that because you'll get a lot more information during that time. So, Joe, I want to go to you. Uh, you're in Palm Beach, right near where Parkland was. Um, that was, wasn't that Valentine's Day 2018, I believe? Yeah, right. So, my question to you is, now you're five years out. So, do the schools look like prisons? Do you, I mean, how do you have that balance? Are people feeling safe and comfortable on the campuses? Or do you still feel it while you're there? What it, what is it five years later? Yeah, it's, it's, it's never enough for some people, right? Um, it, my, my story is, you know, I, you may have heard some of this conversation about um, to me and Wanda. I was, I was chief of facilities management at Palm Beach County Schools, left there to go into construction business, and then came back um, after Wanda left as now the COO. And during that interim period, I was a contractor, and um, my firm had submitted a proposal to do some, modern, some renovations at Stoneman Douglas, and then between the time we submitted the proposal and the time we actually made the presentation to win the project, the incident happened at, at mm -hmm. Stoneman Douglas, right? So we come into the presentation, total, total different mindset, right, than what mm -hmm. we originally put into the proposal, the, the, the documents that we put in there. And uh, we end up winning that, that contract um, to do the work at that school. Um, but it... It changed, like Juana said, it changed everybody. You know, it just it changed everybody. And that that following year, um, I took the lead in putting together a conference called the South Florida Safe School um, School Safety uh, Summit to bring together people to talk about what we need to do to exactly what you said to make our schools safer without making them feel like prisons. And um, we we. <laughs> To this day, now in the back of the district, we have parents who are asking us to put barbed wire on our fences, to do bulletproof glass, to bring in the Mossad to provide security services with you know automatic weapons. And I mean, they, I'm hearing all this kind of stuff from parents because, and you, and they're they're they have these tear jerking speeches about the, their concern for their kids. Right. So it's 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 not stuff that I'm I'm taking lightly because I hear them. And I want to make them feel like their 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 kids are safe, but I also know that when you have a psychotic person out there, there's almost nothing you could do to stop that person, right? So you hear my voice too, because I want to make these kids safe. Um, but we are we put together a a, a task force or a, or a work group um, we call the District um, Safety Security Standards for us to consider these kind of things that we need to do to to make our schools safer. Um, in an equitable fashion, too, because we have, one thing you may not know about Palm Beach, we have the richest communities and we have the poorest communities. You know, we have, 
you know, the billionaires living on the island of Palm Beach, and we have really, um, you know, migrant workers living in the glades. And um, so not, not all of our schools can afford to do the same kind of things, but I have parents who are willing to say, I'll, I'll stroke a check for $100,000 if, you know, allow me to do this at my school, whereas others, you know, they can barely afford to, to put stuff in their kids' backpacks. So, um, so we have to provide this in an equitable way, equitable way to make sure that all of our, schools, our students are safe. Um, but at the same time, I don't want to turn down parents who have the means to do some things because I want, but, but I want to make, I want to make them understand that you can't just do for your kids. You got to do, we have to, mm -hmm. have to make sure everybody feels safe. So we're, there's, like when I said, there's never, there's never an end to this because we're continuing to learn things. There's a single point of entry. There's the Sally ports. There's, there's, there's guard shacks. We're doing all these kind of things to create layers and layers. As, as uh, Wanda said, we want to slow them down because there's almost nothing we could do to ever stop everybody. Slow them down to give our, our police force enough time to get there to, 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 to protect our kids. I, want, I wanted to add, Joe, too, that one of the things that um, I think we've all seen is the cooperation of law enforcement. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, we had an um, uh, um, incident that occurred where I, one of our high schools that, um, that, you know, was an active shooter on campus and all of that. And our law enforcement, HPD, and our sheriff's department, they were on site in like a minute, mm -hmm. a few minutes. I'd never seen that before. Mm -hmm. uh, and they all communicated with each other. So one of the things that I've learned from uh, having these experiences is that when we have tragedies like this, uh, it really draws us closer together. You know, if you look at the COOs, mm -hmm. our community is really small right now. Mm -hmm. uh, People are retiring and so forth. And it is so important that we stay actively engaged. And I think the K-12 Forum uh, really helps us do that and share experiences. But if there's anything good that can come from a, a, a tragic situation, it's the fact that we are aware of, uh, of what's happening. And then I think that we're all actively trying to do something to make it better uh, for kids. Um, if we one of the things that I believe is really important, I've always um, um, said this to um, my staff, is that we always got to put kids first, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, and a lot of people say that, but I believe it's really important that we do that. Um, because at the end of the day, you know, if we don't, what's the alternative, you know? Yeah, when you mentioned uh, the police, um, one thing that we did in our district that I think made a huge difference is we had police and fire always did their drills in our schools. Mm -hmm. We offered our facilities up for them for any time that they wanted to do active shooter drills or the fire department getting a ladder up on a building or anything like that. Um, the community could see them. We would let people know that this was a drill and that, you know, so they felt safe knowing that our first responders were working with the district. But also, those guys knew our sites. They knew how to get in. They knew where to go. They knew a lot of the staff. We even role played with some students. And things like that are things you can do when there isn't a crisis. And it makes such a huge difference when there is a crisis. So yeah. encourage everybody to do that. I want to make sure we get to some of your uh -huh. things. So we're going to, we could talk about this all day long. Uh -huh. And I'm sorry to say that because that's not the thing that we want to be talking about. And neither is this. <laughs> We're going to talk about resources now. And what do you do when there's supply chain issues, there's higher construction costs, labor shortages, you have all of these things. So Roy and Wanda, in your, in your districts, what are the deficiencies and where do you have sufficient resources and funding? Well, that's a quick answer. Um, <laughs> We don't. <laughs> yep. Um, do I have any deficiencies? Wow. You know, we, we, you know, as I said before, I, I led with we haven't had a bond since 2012. Mm -hmm. That is significant. Um, what we try to do is, you know, I have a very um, um, uh, accomplished staff, and we leverage what we do have, mm -hmm. you know, in the best possible way. Um, sometimes they get gets hijacked by, you know, politics or whatever. But 
again, you know, we stay true to what the need is. Um, it is our intent to go out for a bond uh, next year. And it will be the largest bond probably in the history of Texas. Mm. And so one of the principal items that we're going to focus on is safety and security. We have aging uh, facilities. Uh, we have, you know, really new high schools, really old elementary schools. And so we have to uh, kind of address that gap. Um, and so, as I said before, you know, we have uh, access uh, cards and cameras and all of that, but I think it's time to, you know, we have to look at upgrading our equipment because a lot of it is very aged, old. And then the other part too is that we have to move towards the 21st century in terms of, you know, um, how we um, protect our facilities. And we have pieces, we have about, what, five or six different um, uh, systems uh, to control air. I mean, we, we, we just have so many needs. And so when I say that, you know, it is a funding issue, but it's also a decision issue to make sure that we make the right decisions uh, when we go after this bond next year uh, that will sustain the district uh, for a period of time. So we look at it as a 20-year project. So every five to six years, we're going to go out for another bond. Mm -hmm. no. So, and, and that's how you have to sustain it um, over time. So in our vision, it's a 20-year vision. So from our standpoint, the uh, big resource issue we have is just not enough personnel out there. And unfortunately, we do not pay salaries compared to what the private sector is. So uh, when we're paying uh, bus drivers $18 and you have Amazon out there paying $25 to $30 with probably better benefits than we're able to provide, mm -hmm. it's a competition to trying to get quality staff to, to work and do these I don't mess with Amazon now, you know. <laughs> That's right. We can't. You're right about that. We all depend on Amazon. <laughs> I just wish we could pay our bus drivers $25 bucks I, th an hour. I think we'll get there eventually. Yeah. I, I think we had a a tremendous pay package. Uh, our starting teachers was 61.5. Oh. We haven't had a pay pack or a, a, a raise in Houston for a lot of years. Mm -hmm. And so they took a very uh, methodical approach to it. So we have people happy for the moment. Uh, <laughs> you know, because it's what have you done for me lately? Yeah. Mm -hmm. But, uh, and then we es use the ESSER money, leverage that for um, uh, retention. Um, bonuses, bonuses and stuff, and stuff yeah. like that. So that helped quite a yeah. bit. Uh, and so we have to be innovative, you know, going forward. Yeah. Uh, it, it can't be just what we did before. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think, too, you know, I, I look back and see the amount of money we spent on the facility side. Yes, it's probably needed to give that comfort level uh, to our parents and our community. But I also look at if we could have taken that $250 million and invested it in a different way in terms of putting more mental health folks on, on our campuses mm -hmm. and try to do some of the prevention, uh, we wouldn't probably be having to spend as much money as we're spending on the facility side of things. Another interesting fact from Houston is that the enrollment we have right now um, what is it, Alicia, uh, how many years ago, uh, tw 15 years ago, 20 years ago, uh, we had 50 less schools. Wow. wow. Right? <laughs> so, yeah, think about it. And so when I say what adjustments have we made uh, to decline in enrollment over years, the answer is none. Mm -hmm. and, and that's going to be the issue we have to solve in the future. And it's not just about, and it shouldn't be just about closing um, black and brown schools, mm -hmm. right? Because that's, ten, that's what we tend to do, mm -hmm. you know, in, in big urban districts, um, because that's where the, the population is dwindling, where kids have other options, charter schools, and, and so forth. And so, again, it, it, it's the innovation piece. Uh, Dallas did a really good job uh, of dealing with that um, some years ago uh, when I was uh, there. And so 
it, it, it is a challenge because the, out of all of this, the enrollment piece is the scariest piece. Yep. Because we've mm -hmm. seen in large urban districts where they have, uh, they're a fraction of what they used to be in the past. And I really believe that um, no one can do it better than we can in terms of educating kids. You know, um, that is my belief system. Uh, and the challenge is, you know, how do we bring our kids back? Mm -hmm. So with bond measures and with what kinds of things schools are offering and, and things, I think the data piece is very important. Again, I'm with Facilitron right now, but um, every six, after you've been on the platform for six months to a year, we do a full-blown cost analysis, which will take your information, everything we've gathered in the platform, and then what your wages are, what your construction costs are, all of those things, so that we can share with you exactly what it costs you to run your gym, what is it for, to run a theater, or then you also have utilization data, so you know in this area of town, we have a huge need for soccer fields. They're never enough. Over here, people are wanting gyms more. And you can use that data to go out to the community and say, we really need more of this. We're seeing a real need here. We do have a lot of districts in the country who have had to close schools. And when they've closed them, they're leasing them out. They're leasing out their facilities or they're renting facilities to community groups and things. But uh, it's a tough call, especially if you you think it's one way, but you don't have the data to back it up, and then you make a big move, and it may not be exactly what you were thinking. Which brings me to Florida. We have a lot of accounts in Florida. I spend a lot of time there. I primarily work with districts on policy change, on procedures, that kind of thing. We have Orange County Public Schools, Hillsborough County Public Schools. We're just implementing in Broward now. We have many, many districts in Florida. And the one thing that they are always talking about with me are charter schools. And so Joe, I wanted to know uh, if you could kind of give us the history of how charter schools started, what was the purpose of them, and now what have they become? <laughs> yeah, well, charter schools originally were there just to fill the gap, right? To uh, give parents an option. And, um, and they were only in locations where we weren't serving students well, quote unquote. Well, and then, um, and they were, they had to go through the school district in order to get their charters. And, you know, we, 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 and we still oversee charter schools, but now we've grown. Um, I forget what it was when I first was at the district, but now we have over 50 charter schools in Palm Beach County. So we have 180 regular uh, public schools, our public schools, but 50 charter schools. That's a lot of competition that we're dealing with, right? Um, and we started, even before the pandemic started, we started to see enrollment um, kind of level off, um, even decline in some of the areas. But uh, the pandemic has been a big hit to us. It's been a big hit to the charter schools as well. Um, but now we are we find ourselves in a position where we're about 6,500 students less now than we were prior to the pandemic. And part of that is because of parents, during the pandemic, parents started to explore other options, right? They explored the, explored the charter schools, private schools, homeschooling, you know, uh, business learning, all different kind of options. So that's those different things have been um, challenges for us. Uh, we are starting to see our, our enrollment creep back up. Um, in fact, we uh, we opened up a new elementary school last year. Uh, next year, we're opening up a new middle school and a new high school um, because we still have pockets of overcrowded schools in our in our district. And where we're where we're seeing the biggest challenge is in the middle schools where. Um, you know, we're, who are not performing very well. Um, we have middle schools that are at 50% of their capacity. Um, one of the things that started happening, I guess, um, um, Juan was part of this, this process as well, was to convert, well, to, to build more K-8 schools. And I think that's been mm -hmm. common throughout the country. And that's been very successful in some of our schools to, the, to make these K-8 schools. I, I think parents like having their kids in the same location for longer periods of time. So I... I see more of that happening um, as we go forward. Uh, we're, we have this whole reimagining issue going on with our, our middle schools. Uh, we just have completely gone through a new strategic plan um, where our, our emphasis is on educating, affirming, and inspiring our students. Um, I do want to point out that we are an A-rated school district in, in, in Florida. So it's, uh, it's, that's, we have that going for us. And we just passed another referendum 
on the on the operational side to pay teachers more money um, and provide mental health professionals and provide more choice in in um, fine arts programs. So that's we've been fortunate and blessed by by the support of our taxpayers to support us on both the operational referendums we had and the capital uh, um, uh, referendums that we've had in the past. So we're we, we're spending the money and we're competing. One of the things that you hear from our our CF our our, our new um, superintendent. Um, is the former CFO, and he talks in terms of market share. Okay, so he's challenging every school to maximize your market share. That what that is is basically looking at students who are total students in your in your boundaries, who are you know attending public school or not attending public school, going to private school, charter school, whatever it is. What percentage of that are you hitting, and how can we help? How can we as a district help you? maximize or, or improve that number so we can we can make sure we're getting many, as many students as possible into your school. So that's been our focus with our strategic plan. Our next five years is really trying to, of course, is, you know, focusing on um, pre-K to third grade reading and making sure these kids are ready, um, focusing on mental health issues that we talked about, focus on safety and security, but also talking about good customer service and making sure that we're providing that experience so parents will choose us to, so that they know that we're their best choice. Mm -hmm. So we've switched to enrollment now. So yes. why don't you go ahead and tell us what's happening in Cypress Fair? Fair we've been we've actually overcome the loss that we had through the pandemic. We lost about three thousand students, and we've gained those back. And we're gaining now about a thousand to fifteen hundred students per year right now. Uh, we think we're going to stay a lot. We're right now we're at one hundred seventeen thousand students. We think we're going to max out around one twenty to one twenty two. Um, our community is pretty well well developed. We're probably eighty nine percent developed in terms of land area. Area, so there's not as much growth for us anymore. It's all pretty much on the west side of the district. Uh, we just opened up an elementary school. We're opening up another elementary and middle school next year. And then we have a 13th high school on the horizon, which is what our demographic plan is showing in terms of long range. And for us, we're doing lots of K through five, uh, pre-K through five. And so we have three other elementaries that are projected over the next five years uh, to be open inside fair. So we just, we've had that steady growth um, you know, since the pandemic, which is it's a good sign because that's more yeah. revenue coming in. And then hopefully parents are starting to allow their kids to come back to school now. Uh, we have about 3% of our population, student population that's in charters. Um, and we've got a few more that are opening up. So we know the competition starting to, to heat up a little bit in our district and, and giving those parents a, their choice. But probably like all three of us, we all feel that public education is the best way to go. You know, we give them a full rounded education. You go to some of the charters, they might not have some of the athletic facilities and some of the other programs that we can offer in public education. So we feel that uh, that's the best way to do. And what we need to do better job on is marketing what we do best. And, and school districts have not done that over the years. And we're really making a big campaign now to try to, you know, here, this is what we try to do to bring the best out of our students that come to our, our school district. Mm -hmm. So, Wanda, you've mentioned a couple times enrollment dropping in, in Houston. So what kind of things do you attribute that to? Well, you know, <clears throat> prior to me getting there, there was some shenanigans going on. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, and it's all about trust. Um, you have to trust, as a community, you have to trust your board. You have to trust your superintendent. We have an amazing uh, superintendent, uh, Mr. Millard House. I I've been very fortunate that I've worked for, for some amazing um, leaders in my career, whether it were, was in the Army or in public ed. Um, and we have been on a campaign. I've been back for, uh, to Houston for a year on building trust with the community. Very simple things. Uh, don't compromise your integrity. Uh, do what you say you're going to do. Uh, these are tenets I've lived by for a lot of years. Uh, and be transparent. Uh, so we are working towards that. That's why we feel confident that we will be able to go out for a bond um, next year. But the enrollment, you know, I believe in parent choice. You know, as a parent, I don't want anybody telling me where I need to send my kid. And we need to give pa parents better options, right? So charter schools are not the boogeyman that, you know, you know, if you have a good charter school, it's a good charter school. Our problem is competition. We're not used to competing. 
And we're kind of arrogant about that and that we feel like we don't have to compete. Um, and I think that's a, a mistake that we've made over many years. Many of the successful charter schools started out at Houston ISD. Yes, Prep, KIPP, that are now nationwide um, entities. And so, again, I say that uh, we have to transform um, our systems. Um, and in an urban district, it is especially critical because in our system, we, you know, I, I'm a product of HISD. I went to, I was a purple pup, which is uh, Lanier Middle School, and I went to DeBakey High School. But for HISD, I would not be sitting up here. I would have not had the opportunity to go to the University of Texas at Austin. I would have not had the opportunity to be in Army ROTC at UT Austin. So um, I am a proponent of public education, but good public education and great public education. So these next few years for our school district will be critical. Um, I, I'm a, a, a fixer. So I, I, go, I tend to go to districts that I need to fix stuff. Um, I think I've met my challenge here. Uh, but it's, it's a worthy profession. It's an honorable profession. I think that we're in this business uh, of uh, uh, taking care of schools. Uh, you have to do it with your heart and your mind. Uh, and so we will be okay in Houston. But it's going to be a lot of literally blood, sweat, and tears to get us there. Uh, but we will be okay. I think that, you know, as we go forward, uh, there are so many things that you do in your life. You know, God, family, this is my number three. You know, uh, and I think that I, I love Palm Beach. Don't don't get me wrong, Joe. <laughs> uh, Great places. <laughs> yeah, but this is this is the place where the action is. This is the place where we're going to do it in Houston ISD, um, and we have the team to do it. So I'm very, regardless of what I said before, I'm very optimistic that we'll get there. Well, we have five minutes left, and we have four top issues that have come up mm -hmm. in the audience that are keeping you up at night. So I'm just going to... Okay. I'll read one. Somebody jump in. We'll see if we can do this in five minutes. <laughs> okay, staffing. Availability, finding qualified staff and skilled laborers, and the salaries to hire these individuals and keep them. That, that's a big challenge for us right now is that we're not anywhere close to what the current market is and, and we're limited with the resources of budgets and so forth that we get from the state. And so that's a continual focus uh, that we're doing in SciFair is how can we increase the salaries of all our support staff as well as our teachers and administrators to keep the quality staff that we have in place. And, and we were losing lots of people. Uh, you know, we probably got eight, 900 vacancies in our size district and uh, I'm, I'm 140 bus drivers short about the same in our food service department and again it's just we're not competing with the private market and it's a challenge when we're sitting in cabinet and going through budgets you know we know where the focus needs to be but we still have to maintain these facilities so they can be good learning environments for our students so it's a constant challenge for us as to how we get the money we need uh, to be able to provide the uh, services that we do to support our campuses mm -hmm. so those of you who stayed last night and watched the red shoe presentation I think we all need to think about what are the things aside from the money that we can do to keep people motivated and inspired and wanting to do what they do. So uh, you can talk to all of us about that more later. We're going to go on to the second one. Management, maximizing in-house use of space outside of external facility requests. Ooh, we're, we're moving to a remote work policy. In fact, we, we had our first reading on it this about two weeks ago. And we're trying to get rid of people out of our building. <laughs> so, oh. so that's our goal is to maximize it by making sure that we don't have more people in our building than we need. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so I don't know if anybody else had any, anything else. I love that, Joe. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that is the key because, um, you know, we have a relatively new building. Uh, what is it, 12 years old? And we're like busting at the seams. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think 
you know, again, we're a big bureaucracy, but I think that that is probably part of the key to transforming in the future. Right. And that's also part of the answer to the recruitment issue. Is mm -hmm. You can't, I've heard a statistic, the advertisements or job, advertisements that have um, remote work listed in there get three times as many responses as those that don't. So that's, that's part of the solution. And yeah, we got to convince our legal counsel to allow us to do that because uh, they're not real keyed on doing the work <laughs> or hybrid uh, environment there. But one thing we've done, we're building a new administration building that we're going to be moving into in January. So we've added a wellness center, a walking track around the facility. So those are a few extra perks that hopefully we'll, you know, some of our employees will see that'll be a benefit uh, for them to stay at SciFair ISD. Mm -hmm. uh, number three is energy consumption management. Everybody knows utilities are going up on a constant basis. One thing that I do hear from a lot of our districts, though, is they are starting to go to the four-day work week during the summers. It saves on utilities, and it gives people that extra day in the summer more retention. Do any of you do that? Yes. yes. We do it now, yeah. They all do it. <laughs> all do Oh yeah, we also closed during Thanksgiving week, so we're yeah, yeah. So that's same thing for us. Okay, and then what else do you do as far as helping with your energy management? <sighs> yeah, we used to have, and I want to bring it back. Um, we, we, we rewarded schools for improving their energy conservation, so they got a they got a check when they helped us save money. So that that kind of went away in in recent, in recent years, but we want to bring that back to to help them help us save mm -hmm. some money. I ran the energy program at my district, and it's all about behavior. Mm -hmm. Knowing when to have the stuff on and when people aren't in the buildings, making sure that everything is turned off. So yeah. A lot of the safety stuff is also behavior. It is. You no, know, they can throw money at you. They can give you fancy locks. They can give you different doors. Mm -hmm. But um, a lot of it is just the behavior of the people. Yeah. Okay, we're on the last one. We have 45 seconds. <laughs> What have you learned from the pandemic about the capacity for rapid action? I, I, I've learned that it's about people <laughs> and having amazing staff, having patient citizens, having a patient board to help you uh, get through that crisis. Um, and so for that, um, you know, I will be eternally grateful because one of the things that we fail to do is worry about our own mental health. Yeah. Right. right? <laughs> and so um, I, I was introduced to my first chiropractor because my boss made me go, you know. <laughs> mm -hmm. And so we all kind of tried to look out for each, each other. other. And it's just the amazing, um, you know, ability of humans to, to, to be human and be amazing people. That's yeah. That's basically what I learned. I would add the, the the people that are so are in public education are very passionate about what they do. You know, I've worked on the private side, but coming into K through twelve, I've been in thirty two years now. But the passion of the people, they're not in it for the money. They're in it for what they love to do. And that's what made the difference for us is all the people, all our transportation folks, our food service folks. When we had to turn on the dime and figure out how we're gonna start serving these kids that are not getting food anymore because they're not coming to our campuses and how do we feed the community and having to do that basically almost overnight to come up with a plan. So it's, it's great people and, and the passion to do the right thing and, and do things right for kids. Yeah. But they said. <laughs> well, there's time. Thank you everybody for coming today. We're here for the next two days if you want to talk to any of us and we appreciate you being here. Thank you.